Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to wherever you happen to be joining us from around the world. Uh, welcome to the Asia Society and welcome to the Asia Society Policy Institute. And today uh, we are gathered in order to um, discuss and to debate uh, the upcoming 20th Party Congress. We've entitled this Raising the Curtain on China's 20th Party Congress. So we'll see how much curtain we manage to raise after an hour. It's always a tricky business for those of us who have looked at Politburo politics over the years. Um, as the title suggests, we'd like to get a glance behind the scenes in terms of Chinese elite politics and unpack what to expect from China's upcoming 20th Party Congress. And to do this, we've brought together two serious experts in the field. Um, and uh, this is an important um, gathering. Uh, therefore, we brought important expertise to bear. Um, if I could introduce, first of all, uh, from the Asia Society Policy Institute, Chris Johnson, who is our senior fellow. Um, and uh, Chris is a remarkable um, scholar in the area, uh, having worked on Chinese elite politics for many, many years, including his previous career as an analyst in the Central Intelligence Agency. And so uh, he brings a lot of uh, experience to bear in trying to make sense of what is often opaque for the rest of us. Uh, his first two papers, Raising the Curtain on China's 20th Party Congress, Mechanisms, Rules, Norms and the Realities of Power, and his other paper, 2022, Xi Jinping's Anna Cerebellus, or is it? Um, they're already available uh, online on the Asia Society website, and I'd commend both those papers to you. Um, this is all part of a uh, series that we are running at the Asia Society Policy Institute under the title of Decoding the 20th Party Congress. Often the experience of many foreigners is trying to make sense of what seems to be enormously complex. And while there will still be uh, unexplained complexities for those of us who are foreign barbarians trying to make sense of what's going on in China, uh, the bottom line is uh, we're trying to demystify some of the political processes and perhaps give some indication as to possible political outcomes uh, from the 20th Party Congress as well. So this is an important project for us, and you'll see more of us in this series uh, as uh, the uh, months unfold between now and whenever the Congress is held. We're also joined in this conversation today by Dr. Li Ling, specialist in Chinese politics at the University of Vienna. Uh, that's Vienna in Austria, um, not Vienna, Australia, Vienna, Austria. Uh, and uh, and uh, Li Ling is an expert who has spent a lot of time working on the intricacies of the internal organizational arrangements of the Chinese Communist Party. She's previously taught and researched at a number of universities in both Europe and the United States. Dr. Li's focus on research is Chinese politics and law, in particular the operation of the CCP and its different apparatus. And she's published extensively on the Chinese political legal system, as well as corruption and anti-corruption campaigns in China, and is currently writing a book on corruption, law and power struggles, the China model, which will be published next year by Cambridge University Press. So thank you both for joining us. And I'm going to go to Chris Johnson first. Um, Chris, uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, you've put a paper on, uh, on our website. Uh, you've explained your view in terms of the best analytical framework for looking at uh, the 20th Party Congress. Uh, let's turn to you for the next 10 or 15 minutes or so as you unpack your paper for the benefit of those who haven't read it yet, uh, but who may, may now go to the website to read it after your sterling introduction. Over to you, mate. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kevin, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to, to both do the paper and uh, to participate in this session with Dr. Ling Lee, whose work I uh, have read closely and, and very much admire. Uh, in short, uh, the, the task that was sort of given was to sort of explain uh, what are we thinking, as you said, about everything that's going on here uh, and uh, what are the possible outcomes? What does it mean not only for China, but for foreign governments, uh, the United States, its allies and partners, uh, European countries, everyone, uh, and 
countries in the region, obviously. If Xi Jinping is successful, if he's not successful, is he likely to be successful? These are the big questions. I think it's important to say, starting off, that one of the challenges for me, anyway, is that having done this uh, about as long as you have, <laughs> I, um, I feel probably the least comfortable that I ever have going into a party Congress in terms of a sense of exactly where we're heading. Um, and that's something that makes me uncomfortable, um, but uh, and yet is, is a reality. Uh, obviously, the difficulties in um, not really being able to get over there right now um, make it harder to have uh, a good sense of, are we seeing the situation correctly? Are we interpreting things correctly? Um, and that makes it very, very difficult. Uh, also, as I say in the paper, Xi Jinping has, of course, fundamentally changed the information environment in China and, and how easy or difficult it is to get a sense of what's going on. Uh, before we started today's session, Dr. Lee and I were just quickly discussing uh, how, you know, in that more collective leadership period that preceded Xi Jinping's arrival, uh, you had... X number of standing committee members, seven or nine, that meant seven or nine different areas to attach an alligator clip, if you will, and, <laughs> and try to get some in insight and triangulate what was going on. Now there's really only one meaningful pipe of information. So, so that's important. Um, to move on to the to highlights of the paper, uh, you know, my, what I tried to accomplish in the piece was to look at several things. The first was uh, there's a general sense and not without reason uh, that suggests this has been a pretty tough year for Xi Jinping, right? Uh, he certainly felt he was cruising uh, to an easy third term and a grand coronation at the party Congress this fall. If we think about where the position he was in at the end of 2021, having uh, overseen a wonderful celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, and in the fall at the Sixth Plenum, uh, having uh, put out a uh, history resolution that while covering 100 years of CCP history was about 70% the last 10 years, <laughs> and, and his wonderful contribution to China's uh, great rejuvenation and so on. Um, I think the attitude was uh, for 2022, I'm going to have a quick and, uh, you know, sort of um, incident free of controversial Olympics, Winter Olympic Games, and then cruise to victory uh, in the fall. And obviously things have not quite gone that way. We have a war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine. We have Xi Jinping's decision to uh, declare this no limits partnership with Russia, which has been controversial. We have the outbreak of uh, the Omicron variant in COVID and the lockdown in Shanghai and all the other aspects we've seen with that in terms of pressure on the economy and global supply chains and so on. Um, and of course, we have an economy there also that's uh, not in terrific shape. And some suggestion that one of the reasons for that is uh, policies Xi Jinping had pursued last year, including the crackdown on on the private sector. So, you know, not surprising then that that stories have bubbled up that perhaps he's on the defensive or or even will be, you know, significantly constrained coming out of the party Congress, or at least will have to make some trades in terms of personnel horse trading and so on. And my view is that the that assumption or that assessment rests on sort of three flawed assumptions. The, the first is that uh, there's a narrative that seems to have grown up over his decade in power that somehow Xi Jinping uh, sort of pulled one over on the Politburo and, and retired elders and so on in terms of seizing power and something we might look a little bit like a soft coup and took the party in a direction that uh, the rest of the elite doesn't want to hit. Uh, Two, that because of that, uh, he has uh, enemies, uh, very powerful party grandees who oppose what he's doing and would like to at least constrain him, as I said, or perhaps even uh, try to disrupt his uh, ability to get a third term in power. And three, that those policies I mentioned earlier, uh, the misguided policies or blenders, uh, as they're often referred to, uh, give those folks and just the general elite in China the ammunition, at least potentially, that they need to disrupt uh, Xi Jinping's third term. So uh, the paper goes through each of those um, each of those assumptions in, in detail. I'll just cover them uh, quickly and briefly here for our introduction. Uh, on the first, I think it was an opportunity, I took it as an opportunity to review the uh, calamitous situation that Xi Jinping sort of found himself in when he came into power in 2012. Uh, far from a, a seizure of power or a soft coup, uh, he was invited by his Politburo colleagues and mentors uh, to do what he's been doing. They agreed with his, uh, his assessment that the party had gotten itself into a situation of ideological decay, heavy corruption, uh, concerns about how responsive the regime's control apparatus would be in a crisis. Uh, you know, recall the timing here. We're in 
2011 going into 2012, the Politburo is sitting by watching uh, Hosni Mubarak in, in Egypt be dethroned without his military firing a shot and the United States turning its back on a longtime ally to foment yet another color revolution. Uh, we obviously had the fall of Bushy Lai and all the fun that came with that. And a real sense uh, that's been talked about by the regime itself in, in hints and in various documents and so on, that key power centers, the key levers of power that are important to a, a party general secretary in terms of establishing their control, were basically running amok. And in the paper, I go into detail about that with regard to the security services under uh uh, dethroned Politburo Standing Committee member Joe Young Kong, uh, serious corruption in the PLA, the selling of office and uh, buying of rank um, with some of Jiang Zemin's former cronies continuing to be around. And then uh, uh, trouble in the general office, which, of course, is the uh, nerve center of uh, of the CCP. So Xi Jinping saw danger and convinced his colleagues uh, to agree and went off on his campaign. And I think that's important because they haven't changed their minds that the course he set out is the correct one. They may at some point, but so far, the determination seems to have been uh, they're better to hang together with him uh, than to hang separately uh, if there's trouble. On the second assumption about uh, grandees opposing him, obviously, there's been a lot of speculation, um, a lot focused primarily around Premier Li Keqiang, uh, that he was somehow pushing back on Xi Jinping's policies, especially zero COVID and um, the crackdown on the private sector. As I lay out in the paper, um, my sense is that fails to take into account basic mechanics of a, a Leninist system like China's where uh, democratic centralism is, is a thing. <laughs> and people generally, uh, once the line has been set, follow it. But also uh, the, the, it puts too heavy an emphasis on persistence of what I would consider at least questionable and maybe now outmoded uh, analytic models to include uh, factional analyses, uh, maybe institutional bureaucratic bargaining or generational cohort analysis in a situation where Xi Jinping really has fundamentally changed the game. And then on the third assumption with regard to these policies being blenders or failures, um, my view is it's perhaps too early to tell on some of them. Uh, certainly the situation with Russia and Ukraine is very much evolving day to day. Um, if you're China, you've been watching nervously this whole time. This is obviously not what they wanted. Uh, but if we see a situation where down the road, uh, Putin is able to gobble up a certain portion of eastern Ukraine, perhaps get some sanctions relief as a part of his willingness to cease fighting, uh, suddenly Xi Jinping's decision to embrace Russia doesn't look so bad through their dialectical lens uh, where they see in the geopolitical order the United States now as an implacable enemy. Um, so I think it's too early to tell there. Uh, certainly on COVID zero, uh, it doesn't make sense to us, but it does to them. And I don't think there's anyone really in the Politburo who would dispute the fact that uh, they don't want to see China's fragile healthcare system overwhelmed uh, with COVID cases. They don't want to see mass deaths in a party Congress here. And just by the law of numbers in a country as large as China's, that's what would happen if they were to allow COVID to run rampant. So again, you know, too early to tell. That's the negative case. Um, I also tried to, in the paper, uh, put some attention on the positive case. So uh, in the former, we know what it looks like uh, when there's trouble, you know, in, in the elite in China. And frankly, as I just have described, that this isn't it. Um, likewise, on the flip side, we know what the system looks like when it's headed toward apotheosis. And this is it from, from my perspective. So primarily in the areas of personnel, ideology, and also uh, just a general sense of of, uh, of the man of for the times, Xi Jinping has been racking up a lot of uh, laureates, and we can see a campaign building toward things like further aggrandizing him in the party's ideological canon by uh, truncating his current uh, Xi Jinping thought for very horribly long name, just down to <laughs> Xi Jinping thought and things of that nature. And I'm sure we'll go into to greater detail. And then I end the uh, paper by uh, trying to look at some of the policy consequences. In other words, it, 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 we run the risk in looking at things this way of, are we engaged in a uh, analytic or academic debate about angels dancing on the head of a pin? No, my sense is it has important policy implications. Uh, as you and I have discussed many times, uh, the old adage still holds true, which is that uh, good analysis may not necessarily beget good policy, but bad analysis definitely begets bad policy. And uh, in the paper, I discuss what I see to be a sort of the cascading effects 
of the layering of these faulty assumptions and what that can mean in real time. And to close, I think we just saw an episode of that uh, with uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, where a lot of the media coverage and analyst commentary at the time was sort of suggesting, again, in this sort of tiered order, well, Xi Jinping is under pressure. His policies have been blenders, which have made him unpopular, and therefore he's in trouble internally. And the conclusion of that then is we can't be guaranteed that he won't feel some need to respond in a radical or or desperate way, um, which could have caused a, you know a proper crisis uh, in the Taiwan Strait. As we've just seen, that turned out not to be the case. Everything was measured and controlled. We're into a new normal, obviously, with that, but that's not really the subject of today's session. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll have another one at some point to discuss some of those bits. And uh, let me close there. Well, thanks very much, um, uh, Chris. Uh, that was a, a good summation of the, of the paper. Yes, you spoke about new normals. And we'll have a Xin Chang Tai on Taiwan, a Xin Chang Tai on the economy, maybe. And now we've got a Xin Chang Tai on the new normal for uh, leadership uh, for the long term, and certainly beyond the two term limit. Before I turn to uh, Dr. Li Ling, let me just probe you on one or two quick points that you raised. Uh, one was uh, your argument um, that um, Xi Jinping in 2012 was uh, co-opted by the regime to ensure the regime's long-term survival by reinstilling discipline within it. That's my haiku summary of your argument. Very um, solid. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, to what extent do you think... Uh, uh, the regime, and this is a very big term, uh, 10 years in, is experiencing some sense of buyer's remorse? <laughs> um, uh, or is it your view that, um, uh, I, know your, I know your Washingtonian um, allegory, which is better we hang together than hang separately, uh, but um, degrees of buyer's remorse uh, or not? Yeah, uh, certainly. I think there's degrees of buyer's remorse. Uh, if you're uh, Jiang Zemin and uh, his network of people or you're, uh, to some degree, some of the uh, Communist Youth League people around Hu Jintao and so on, uh, you kind of feel like you were sold a, a, a bag of goods or, or that Caviar Adamtor was <laughs> was not, uh, not uh, sufficiently paid attention to. No, my argument is not that Xi Jinping didn't surprise the, these people who sort of uh, co-opted him into, uh, into saving the regime from itself with some of his actions. But I think there was a general sense uh, that there was the most ex existential period of crisis that they faced uh, since 1989. I think that's fair to say. And increasingly, I think they still believe that. So one of Xi Jinping's elements of political genius among several, or maybe political alchemy that I think has served him so well, is this ability to create a sense of urgency or even crisis uh, in terms of the pressures that China is facing domestically, abroad, you know, so on and so forth in the in the dialectic and and, and so on, uh, that justifies his power grab, right? Uh, and I think he's done this very effectively. There's a reason why in recent years he's given an increasing number of speeches where the list of risks that he cites uh, grows exponentially. And he <laughs> In each uh, in each cascading speech, so it gets very difficult, I think, for other members of the leadership uh, to be able to challenge him. The other thing I would just highlight quickly is that we're seeing in Xi Jinping a guy who's reminding us ideology really matters. I, I think another aspect that is really. Um, made it difficult for others to criticize him is this stepwise campaign of his toward uh, ideological crowning um, that then. When criticizing Xi Jinping personally or one of his policies, you're not just criticizing him, you're criticizing the party's line. And that is a very dangerous activity. You can do it, but you better win because if you don't, the consequences will be severe. So my sense is there's grumbling, there's unhappiness, uh, but there's not a situation that's come to a sufficient head where the people who would have to make such decisions feel they're willing to stick their neck up over the parapet and say, we need different leadership. Hmm. The... Um... Um, there's a whole lot in that, which we'll take into further conversation later on. But my uh, second probing point, based on what you've just said, is uh, the um, inapplicability of the factional paradigm for understanding uh, what is happening in the current decade of Chinese politics. I suppose mm -hmm. my question is, uh, was the factional paradigm relevant in the decisions of 2012 on the, mm -hmm. at the 18th Party Congress? And what has caused it to cease to be um, mm -hmm. 
the organizing paradigm for understanding the future trajectory of Chinese internal politics? Mm -hmm. Well, in 2012, my sense is it was uh, very much on display, you know, in a certain way. Uh, certainly, Bo Xi Lai represented, you know, something of a, a faction or grouping, uh, or at least a, uh, a policy point of view. Uh, ironically, Xi Jinping has adopted many of those uh, points of view in terms of, you know, emphasizing the party's history, uh, taking a shine toward uh, earlier periods under Mao that, uh, uh, you know, obviously uh, others uh, feel um, that should not happen and, and have been criticized and so on. And we obviously saw Jiang Zemin, despite having formally retired a decade prior, um, playing a very big role in capitalizing on certain crises, uh, most specifically the uh, troubles, as I alluded to earlier, with Ling Jihua, uh, then Hu Jintao's chief of staff in the general office, to wind up with a Politburo Standing Committee on the other end that still had quite a few Jiang Zemin cronies uh, sitting in critical portfolios. Mm -hmm. And I think Xi Jinping was in a position where having done the smart thing to portray himself as the um, non-controversial understudy, had to kind of bite his time, but then dropped it into gear very, very quickly with the anti-corruption campaign in particular. So I think it did still have some, some resonance. In the paper, I talk about earlier periods, that messy handover from Jiang Zemin to Hu Jintao, where it was questionable whether Hu Jintao actually really ever had control of the system. Uh, Jiang certainly um, hamstrung him from behind the scenes. And earlier periods, even under Deng Xiaoping, where you know it's easy, as I say in the paper, for us to forget uh, because of his many achievements and, and just sort of um, stellar reputation. In, in China, he faced a lot of trouble from his conservative elder uh, partners and friends, and uh, they he won eventually, but it took him a decade and a half to get there. So I think they did apply then. Now, when I look at, say, Li Keqiang or others, um, it's hard for me to determine, is Li Keqiang running a communist youth league faction, a proper faction within uh, the leadership these days? Do people who have that affiliation like Wang Yang and Hu Chunhua feel some sort of patron client relationship with uh, Li Keqiang, my sense is they don't. And likewise, Jiang Zemin's grouping, which was very powerful then, seems to be largely out of gas. Now, he's he's old, he's frail. To the degree there's anyone running the show, it might be Zheng Qinghong. But, you know, occasionally we see stories about how Han Zheng, the, uh, the executive vice premier and Politburo standing committee member, is somehow, you know, trying to... Uh, uh, take the fight to Xi Jinping for, for that grouping's interest. Or we even see stories that suggest that China's approach to COVID and the Shanghai lockdown and so on was Xi Jinping's effort to sort of strangle the last gasp of Jiang Zemin's network. Uh, my approach is, you know, newsflash, uh, they've been strangled for a good number of years. <laughs> well, you made uh, reference just then as I turned to Dr. Uh, Li Ling. Um, Dr. Li, um, Chris has just referred to the uh, use of the anti-corruption machinery of the party as a mechanism for power consolidation by Xi Jinping in the period since 2012. Um, you're an expert in the party's um, internal disciplinary procedures, not just in the Xi Jinping period, but your academic study covers the period since 49. So could you comment for us uh, on how you've seen uh, Xi Jinping apply the anti-corruption machinery both to clean up the party, but also to deal with his political opponents. And secondly, to what extent is this different from the methods used by his predecessors as general secretary? Over to you, Dr. Lee. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And thank you for inviting me to join this important discussion. Uh, the question, the two questions that you just raised for the first one is Xi Jinping using anti-corruption uh, campaign as a method to eliminate enemies and also to clean up the party in general. Uh, yes, uh, uh, you, it's very often in international media that uh, uh, Xi Jinping was accused for using anti-corruption just to eliminate enemies. That is uh, not accurate uh, because his use of the anti-corruption campaign uh, reaches a much wider scope. Uh, first, first of all, in the authoritarian system, an able leader needs to react very strongly and decisively to people who are close to the throne, but disloyal, because that's an existential threat. And sometimes a leader needs to knock down a powerful figure simply for the exemplary deterrence effect to make others fearful. Uh, in Maoist era, the party did not, lead, did not need the 
legal authorization or a trial procedure to lock up a disloyal high-ranking party leader. Liu Shaoqi was put under house arrest for a long time, but had never been convicted by a court of law. Uh, this has changed since the 1980s, where party could no longer lock up a leader uh, with charges of political offenses alone. It needs a criminal conviction, and corruption is a low-hanging fruit offered in the criminal code. Uh, Jiang Zemin used it against Chen Xitong, uh, Hu Jintao used it to eliminate Chen Liang and Bo Xilai, and she did the same, but faster and in greater numbers. Uh, to answer your second question, uh, how is Xi Jinping's anti-corruption uh, different from the anti-corruption activities by his predecessors? Uh, the campaigns in the past relied, I mean, in the Maoist era, relied greatly on mass mobilization to compensate the lack of investigative resources of the party. Uh, the problem of uh, mass mobilization approach is it is difficult to monitor, it's uh, unprofessional, and leads to a lot of wrongful cases and wrongful punishments. And that's why in the past, after a radical political campaign, there was very often a standard review procedure called Jinbie to identify and rectify wrongful cases. Now the investigation is conducted only by specialized institutions of the party and professional agents. The downside of this approach is is costly and hence limits the scope and the impact of the investigative activities. What Xi Jinping had achieved is that he has significantly increased the investigative capacity of the disciplinary institutions of the party and managed to retain that capacity through the reform of the supervision system. When you look at um, the current uh, practice uh, in China, which is called Shuanggui, um, and for the benefit of non-specialist um, uh, viewers of our uh, broadcast today, you might explain what Shuanggui means. Um, if you were to look at the number of people who have been, quote, disciplined uh, in the current campaign since 2012, um, uh, give me a sense of where that fits against historical measures. And secondly, what is the internal debate about the uh, appropriateness or inappropriateness of this Shuanggui system of arresting and interrogating people who are suspected of, quote, high level either corruption crimes or party disloyalty crimes? Back to you. Uh, Shuanggui is uh, literally, it means... Uh, to report to the authority for the purpose of interrogation at the designated time and at the des during the exist uh, designated time and at the designated place. Uh, 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 it sounds very innocuous, but it means detention for an uh, uh, unspecified duration of time. Um, it has been used by the party without even this strong way provision in the Maoist era. Uh, since 1979, after the uh, inauguration of the new criminal procedure law, which has regulated the use of coercive force by the investigative agencies, then there's already a question about whether uh, the disciplinary institution could still use strong way for internal party investigations. And the party's answer to that question is yes, they can still <laughs> use it. And it's uh, uh, brought into this framework of party disciplinary system and was given the name Shuanggui. But since then, it has been criticized very often by legal scholars about its legality. There has been a lot of problems, for example, how to use the evidence obtained through the Shuanggui procedure in court because the party institution is not a state institution and the evidence obtained by this institution does not 
uh, automatically have the authority to be used in the court of law. So very often the case will be transferred to the procuracy and the, procur uh, the procuratorates have to redo the, the interrogation and come out with a different set of, uh, uh, on the different, uh, on the paper with a different stamp that says it's uh, evidence obtained by the procuracy instead of the disciplinary institution so that it can have legitimacy to be used in the court of law. Uh, so that has caused a lot of discussion and criticism. Obviously, there's also the issue about torture that is used in the wrong strong way procedure. So it has been a uh, uh, a sony issue for the party for a long time and everybody is waiting to see how the party is going to resolve the issue and the creation of the national supervision commission was the solution uh, mm -hmm. it literally legitimized the use of strong way by putting by authorizing the national supervision uh, commission to do exactly the same thing with the party institution hiding behind um, just before we go to a more general conversation about the outcomes of the 20th Party Congress, one further question on uh, Shuang Gui and the use of torture. Um, is there much internal literature on this question about uh, the use of uh, extreme measures uh, in extracting confessions? And, um, and again, I go back to my quantitative question. In terms of the numbers of people who have been subjected to Shuang Gui, how does it compare with previous uh, regimes? Uh, now, uh, first of all, now Shuang Gui has been replaced by the Liu Zhi uh, mm. measure. It's now called detention Liu Zhi uh, uh, because there are so many different forms of detention uh, under different names. The one that is used by the Supervision Commission is called Liu Zhi. And when people are under Liu Zhi, you don't have access to lawyers even. While in the criminal justice system, you can have limited access to lawyers. So the, and there's uh, more confidentiality and secrecy about the use, about the entire investigative procedure under the national under the supervision institution compared to under the police or even uh, procuratorates. Uh, I don't have the numbers exactly, but most of people who, especially high level party leaders who are later convicted for corruption uh, had all gone through the Liu Zhi procedure uh, because that's very important procedure where the investigator obtain evidence to prove the guilt that will be used in law. Uh, so I, I would think for all political cases, the probably 95 uh, percent will go through the Liu Zhi procedure. However, the, I, I'm saying 95 percent, not 100 percent, because I do see occasional cases where uh, Liu Zhi was not even applied, but the, the, the suspect volunteered evidence or the investigator managed to obtain evidence without the confession from the suspect to establish the case. Good, thank you. So let's turn to um, uh, the 20th Party Congress itself and uh, possible political outcomes. I'll come back to you on this one, Chris. Um, sure. Then I'll come to uh, uh, Dr. Lee as well. Our first cr uh, criteria before we go down to personalities is, well, how many vacancies are there going to be? <laughs> of course, this goes to the, um, to the uh, deeply arcane science of uh, what we call in the business uh, qi shang ba xia which Indeed. is if, if you're if you're under 67 um, at the time of the congress well you can stay on uh, if you're uh, if you're 68 and above you can't that's my crude lay summary of it um, if we applied that piece of logic uh -huh. then leaving aside um, shirada uh, numero uno uh, <laughs> if we put e hold to one side Yes. But of the 25 uh, members of the Politburo, including the Standing Committee of Seven within it, mm -hmm. uh, then my calculus is you're looking at 10 vacancies. Mm -hmm. um, is, are we agreed numerically on that? Have I got something yes. wrong? No, you're right. Dr. Lee, is that, that that's about right? Have we looked at Chishan Basia correctly applied? Uh, well, uh, very often when we talk about the age limit rule, 
we conflate the General Secretary, the Politburo, and the Politburo Standing Committee into one group. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost like walking into an Asian fusion restaurant in continental <laughs> Europe, where you can find chow mein, sushi, pho, pad thai on the same menu. Uh, I think it would be much clearer if we separate them and treat them as three distinctive groups because they enjoy different levels of privileges, which are consequential to answer the question: How many vacancies will be created? So, if we go to the Zong Shuji, which is the general secretaryship, I mean, your point to me, Dr. Lee, is that、uh, we certainly have a precedent as it relates to、uh, Hu Jintao, which is that he was treated like the rest of the standing committee. And because he was over sixty-seven at the time、uh, of the Eighteenth Party Congress, then、uh, said yeah,、uh, <laughs> and uh, so that was、uh, farewell,、uh, Uncle Hu.、Um, but if we flick back to the previous party congresses, for example, what would have been, I think, the Sixteenth Party Congress in nineteen ninety-seven. Am I right? I've got my numbers. Fifteenth and ninety-seven. Fifteenth and ninety-seven. Which is, of course,、uh, Jiang Zemin's、um, uh, rear point. He was already seventy-one years old,、um, and therefore, if you like, he didn't quite c- adhere to Qi Shang Baoxia, and so <laughs> his his、uh, his circumstances were therefore a bit dui wu ar.、Um, we go back to his predecessors.、Um, When Zhao Ziyang was purged, I don't even remember how old Zhao Ziyang was when he was purged, but、um, but it was certainly、uh, we didn't get to test it at the subsequent party congress, nor did we get to test it with、uh, Hu Yaobang and Deng Xiaoping. Well, he wasn't general secretary till way back in the 1950s, and、um, and occupied other positions after 78. So. Your thesis overall, as I understand it, Dr. Lee, and I appreciate your comment on this too, Chris, is that purely on the position of the general secretary, this、um, uh, retirement rule、um, was、uh, really only、uh, applied to Hu Jintao, and the related rule, which is you get two terms, the younger and she.、Um, Really, only applied to Hu Jintao as well, because after all, Jiang Zemin got two and a half terms. So, this is a very crude summary from me.、Um, but firstly, Chris, your comments, and then to Dr. Lee. Sure. Well,、uh, I, that's a good summary.、Uh, and uh, I, as I highlight in、uh, the second of my <laughs> my two papers about some of the mechanics and and norms and rules,、uh, you know, this issue of the age restriction is very interesting. And I think,、uh, kind of like、uh, our earlier discussion of、uh, the circumstances around 2012, it's important to remember where this thing came from, right? And、uh, it came from Jiang Zemin、uh, in a pure demonstration of power politics.、Uh, you're right at the 15th Party Congress. He、uh, Gave himself an exemption, or rather,、uh, his good friend Boi Bo,、uh, <laughs> Bo Shilai's father,、um, was called out of central casting to suggest that、uh, Jiang Zemin be allowed to stay on,、um, and then an age rule of seventy actually be set、um, at at that party congress, which was used to dispatch Chao Shi at the time,、uh, a gentleman who had been a、oh, long time sort of, <laughs> yeah rival of of.、Uh, Of、uh, Jiang Zemin, and because he had a long-standing experience in the security services, and also was seen as something of a, a flag bearer of sorts for、uh, certain more reformist elements in the system, you know, he was a person who、uh, was serious, right?、Um, and yet he was dispatched. And then、uh, fast forward, as you said, to the 16th Party Congress in 2002. Not only did Jiang Zemin manage to hang on in the Central Military Commission chairmanship. But he lowered the age restriction to the current Qi Shang Baoxia situation to dispatch another rival, Li Rei Huang, right? Who,、mm. under a seventy rule, would have been allowed to stay,、um, and was another long-term thorn in in Jiang Zemin's side. So I think that's very relevant、uh, because, yes, it's true they have largely abided by Qi Shang Baoxia in the subsequent party congresses between the sixteenth and now. But it's not a rule; <laughs> it can easily be adjusted. And in fact, very interestingly, I think it was in the、uh, Um, six plenum ahead of the nineteenth party congress.、Um, you know, it was no coincidence that a gentleman from,、uh, I believe it was the、uh, either the general office or, or the party research office, sort of came out and said, "This thing is fiction. This idea of Qi Shang Baoxia. You know, the party makes adjustments as it sees necessary." So, to your comment at the top of this round of discussion about vacancies,、um, I see no reason. I, I guess when I think about Xi Jinping's mindset and standard operating procedures, I, I feel an as important, if not more important, question to answer is. 
why wouldn't he change the age restriction <laughs> as opposed to why would he in part because especially on the Politburo Standing Committee, if he lowers it by one year to 66, the Kachang goes away uh, and so do Wang Yang and Wang Huning, right? So uh, instead of maybe one or two vacancies, you have many more to uh, cram with your allies. So I think it's Joker's wild on, on the age restriction issue myself. Dr. Lee, on uh, Qishan Basia, 67, 68, and uh, are we excessively fixated on this or should we be more fixated on the two-term limit? Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a different interpretation of the Qishan Basia rule, which can fix the holes that Chris has mentioned in his paper about the three exceptional cases where uh, three Politburo members who were under the age but did not stay. Uh, coming back to what I mentioned earlier, uh, where I propose that we separate the three uh, uh, groups of uh, top leadership, the, the general secretary, the Politburo standing committee members, and the Politburo members, because they, they enjoy different level of privileges. Uh, Politburo uh, standing committee members, they, they enjoy the first rank, uh, the chief national rank, which is uh, the top rank in the ranking system, and Paul Bureau members only enjoy the deputy secondary national ranks. And the privileges are different as well. Uh, for Paul Bureau standing committee members, they, for a long time, they enjoyed life tenure uh, unless they are uh, unseated from the office by purge or they volunteer to retire. Otherwise, they can automatically resume their membership at the Power Bureau Standing Committee until their death. And the age limit rule started to take shape to end that uh, life tenure in the 1990s. And now that is the only exiting mechanism to regulate the retirement of the Paul Bureau Standing Committees, which means if they are under 68 and are alive and not purged, <laughs> they can resume their membership at the end of their current term. But that privilege is not extended to Paul Bureau members. Uh, age limit for them is only one of multiple factors that determines whether they must retire or they can stay. That means if you are beyond uh, or above 68, then you must leave. But if you are under, it depends. Uh, So if we look at it, the rule that way, uh, in different layers, then we will see it holds uh, for both Paul Bureau Standing Committee, committee members and Paul Bureau members. And if the privilege, a uh, more privilege is extended to General Secretary, who is not bound by the age limit rule after all, then he can have his own rules and still keep the rule regulating the other ordinary Paul Bureau Standing, standing Committee members and Paul Bureau members. So basically the rule is it's whatever I feel like. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> for for so, the general secretary. That's, At least. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but also um, if you go beyond the standing committee uh, to the rest of the Politburo, which is uh, 18 members of the non-standing committee Politburo, effectively uh, if age is a criteria, there are multiple criteria, then you could be exited at whatever age um, and not be renewed. And with the precedence for that as well. So let's go to the question uh, which um, uh, most folks uh, beyond uh, the narrow uh, domains of Sinology, which we three occupy, uh, are interested in, which is, so who gets the top jobs? Um, which is what they're interested in. Let's just assume uh, that of the seven in the standing committee, there are going to be two vacancies. Um, Is that a fair assumption uh, in terms of who do you think is going, Chris? And then can I ask for your comments, uh, number going, who's going, and who is in the leading positions of contention to replace them? You first, and then I'll turn to you, Dr. Lee. Sure. Uh, well, I, I think uh, as we were just discussing, it depends. And 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 one um, one comment as well. Uh, you know, we we've just been discussing 
the polit the size of the Politburo itself as some sort of fixed number of twenty five, right? Well, uh, it has been for a bit, but <laughs> it's been all kinds of different shapes and sizes, you know, over the years that the CCP has been in power, and there's no reason that can't change as well. I'm not sure it will, but you know, uh, there, there's really no reason that can't change. Uh, in terms of the uh, members of the Standing Committee, yes, if if they follow the general procedures they've been following, and Tishan Basha being one of them, um, then in theory there should only be those couple of vacancies. Um, and so therefore limited room, you might say, for Xi Jinping, or if there is something to the notion that um, he has detractors that uh, will, because of his uh, failed policies, be able to uh, demand that he make concessions to them in terms of personnel um, for them to fill you know, those few vacancies. Uh, my sense is that uh, that is not necessarily uh, a good thing for China. In other words, as we've been discussing earlier in our session, we know what it looks like when the leadership is uh, hyper collectivized and there's no clear uh, number one. Right. Uh, it leads to policy drift <laughs> and, and messes. Right. You know, the system uh, tends toward gridlock under those conditions. So that's an interesting thing to consider uh, in terms of who might get what jobs. You know, uh, obviously, we will have to wait and see. I think the general consensus view is uh, obviously Li Keqiang does have to leave as premier. So that will be a, a major position that will be opening. Um, if they follow the procedures and he survives, the conventional wisdom seems to be that he might move to, say, the legislature. There's precedent for that. Li Peng did that when he uh, left the premiership and went over to uh, the National People's Congress chair. Uh, so there's a precedent there. And I think the general view is the two most likely candidates to succeed Li Keqiang are Wang Yang, uh, who's already a standing committee member, but uh, had been a vice premier previously and uh, served in many provinces and has a good, solid track record, or Hu Chunhua, right, uh, who is currently serving as a vice premier and therefore has uh, the track record. Some analysts have noted that um, there has never been a premier in the system who wasn't a vice premier first. Um, and, uh, you know, that's true. I also like to raise, though, how many premiers have there been? You know, I mean, this is the problem with a lot of these assessments of norms when we're dealing with two cases, three cases. <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard to tell whether those are actually norms or not. And then, obviously, uh, the other position, Han Zheng, is, is above the age limit, so he will have to go um, as well and um, probably be placed uh, as executive vice premier. So that will be an opportunity perhaps for someone uh, to put uh, someone in that position. Historically, we've seen in a more in an era where factional models had more analytic explanatory power, there would be a balance factually between a premier and the vice premier to sort of hamstring the premier, right? Or vice versa. Um, we may not see that this time. And then of course, the big question is, will Xi Jinping try to get one of his own allies appointed as premier? Uh, obviously there was a lot of discussion around Li Chang, the Shanghai party chief, but with the lockdown mess there and so on, I think the general assessment is that will be a stretch uh, for him to be able to do so. I just hold open uh, the argument as well, and we can discuss this further in our discussion if we want. We could see a more disruptive scenario where someone who's not even sitting on the Politburo could be made premier, um, and that could make things very interesting. <clears throat> hmm. So uh, just before I turn to Dr. Lee on this one, in terms of if we're applying 68 um, the 68 must retire rule to the standing committee. And for the benefit of our audience, uh, the exits from the Politburo, standing committee of the Politburo would be Han Jung. Sorry. The retirements. Exits. Yeah, the retirements. Yeah, the exits. Yeah. So he would be gone, and um, the current chairman of the uh, National People's Congress, Lee Jiangshu, uh, who's, I believe, mm -hmm. 70 or something like that already, uh, would be gone as well. So Li Danchu and uh, who's very close to um, uh, to Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping. yes, uh, and uh, Han Zheng, and then um, current age of Li Keqiang is what sixty seven. So right. he's right on point. <laughs> he's, right, he's right on point. So therefore, he could technically be retained. He could if those uh, norms are followed. Yeah. And uh, it would be, though he's already made one statement. This is his last report, remember? Uh, oh, you mean as premier? No, because, of course, there's a limit. Uh, when Xi Jinping got rid of the term limits, it was only for the presidency and I believe the vice presidency. Uh, so um, as premier, he's stuck. He has to leave. <clears throat> That's right. So the possible retention, therefore, is for him to stay in the standing committee and then to go to become chairman of the National People's Congress. Most uh, likely. Yeah. So, and that would be, how surprising would it be if Li Keqiang gets uh, nixed altogether? 
it wouldn't surprise me, but <laughs> I think it would surprise a bunch of people. I mean, one, one interesting aspect is does Xi Jinping see him as any kind of a problem or threat or challenge, you know, uh, if he doesn't, and I think he doesn't, why not retain, you know, sort of yet another eunuch? Uh, if he does, though, the thing that sticks in the back of Xi Jinping's mind, I think, is let's not forget there was a period in time. I'm not sure how valid it ever was, but I think it's fair to say where Li Keqiang was at least considered something of a rival of his for the top position. I mean, that was a thing, you know, and, and in earlier periods. If you're Xi Jinping and your campaign now is to uh, declare yourself Uber Lord potentially forever and uh, the second coming of Mao Zedong, are you comfortable having someone who used to be seen at, by some as your rival still sitting in the top leadership? I'm not sure you are. Hmm. So two, possibly three vacancies at the standing committee level, uh, possibly uh, Hu Chunhua to go up, possibly into the premiership. Um, and a uh, question mark as to who else would therefore go into the standing committee uh, beyond. Yeah, I think so. And uh, Chen ming uh, what's your view there? Well, uh, he certainly seemed like someone who had a lot of potential um, running up to the last party Congress. He's, he's been very quiet, I think it's fair to say, uh, since then. Xi Jinping uh, is close to him. He's seen as a very loyal uh, ally. Uh, my sense is uh, he certainly has potential he, he, of being on the short list. But you don't hear about, you know, a Chen Minar and X combination, Hu Chunhua, for example, combination anymore as, again, the, the once and future successors. Right. And so that, I think, complicates Chen Minar's picture uh, a little bit. Um, but he is a very loyal and faithful follower of Xi Jinping. So if there's room, you know, and let's say there are more standing committee vacancies again, you know, if they were to you know, cut that age restriction by a year, you've got then five vacancies instead of two, right? <laughs> and so that makes things much more interesting in terms of the prospects for other Xi Jinping allies. If you did that, though, you'd lose Wang Huning as the permanent scribe of all central. Uh, you would, but uh, as we've been, for those of us who've been watching it closely, there's a gentleman named the Xu Lei who has just been promoted to the executive uh, deputy director of the propaganda department, who is, uh, from my perspective, just as talented of a dream weaver as, as Wang Huning. <laughs> so on this question of personalities, Dr. Lee, um, and I know you're a good scholar and a good academic, and you don't like speculating on personalities, but... Uh, that's what um, uh, that's what uh, Chris and I do for a living. <laughs> so, uh, um, your reflections on uh, the uh, possible possible uh, elevations to the standing committee and the possible uh, let's call it composition of the economic team led by the premier. Um, first of all, uh, I just want to have a quick response to what Chris has uh, has talked about regarding the uh, binding force of the age limit rule, because we have so uh, few instances to study. But uh, just for Paul Bureau Standing Committee members, we have 28 cases where the age limit rule has been applied to in the last 20 years. Uh, so in, in, in the term of party experience, that's uh, quite a, a clear trend. And uh, I think uh, talking about uh, personalities, uh, I believe Xi Jinping is very much aware of, and I would say appreciates the value of institution as an indispensable tool of authoritarian political governance. Uh, most of the feats of power centralization that he has been accused of uh, doing were carried out within the remits that are allowed in the institutional framework laid down by the party. And uh, as I said earlier, the age limit is the only exit mechanism to end a Paul Bureau Standing Committee member's tenure. And it is very objective and easy to enforce fairly. So to discuss to discard the rule would make it very difficult for him to regulate the access of Paul Bureau Standing Committee members in the future. Uh, one cannot simply purge them one by one or en masse. Uh, Wang Tisheng was a very testing case in 2017. Wang was uh, 69 at the time and C complied with the age limit rule and Wang vacated his seat. Uh, so I would predict that Xi Jinping would continue to observe the age limit rule, which means that two seats will be vacated, as we discussed, from the current Politburo Standing Committee. But 
However, there's also a very uh, strong possibility that he will pack the courts, add two more seats to the Politburo Standing Committee. Then we will have even more vacancies. Uh, as uh, to the possible candidate for the premiership, uh, I totally agree with uh, Chris that uh, Li Keqiang will leave the, the premiership and is very likely to, uh, to, to be able to retain his Power Bureau Standing Committee membership and move on to the National People's Congress. And to replace him as a pre new premier, I, I, I would bet on Hu Chunhua because first, his age appropriate, and second, he has been trusted to oversee one of Xi Jinping's pet projects, the Poverty Alleviation Program in the State Council. And third, he seems to be amiable uh, in terms of personality. And very recently, the People's Daily published a three half page article under the name of Hu Chunhua, where he mentioned Xi Jinping's name 52 <laughs> times. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good signal of promotion for uh, Hu Chunhua's campaign to, to the Paul Bureau Standing Committee. That's a very if I can just add two two quick points there. Uh, the first is is that I, I agree with Dr. Lee that uh, Xi Jinping certainly does support the concept of uh, some manner of institutions or institutionalization. In fact, even he says uh, power should be kept within a cage of regulation, right? So uh, this is something that um, he, he very much believes in. I think, again, another source of his unique political alchemy in my mind is knowing when to tweak, adjust, um, completely disregard those institutional arrangements to his own benefit uh, is, is something that he does very, very well. Um, similarly, on Hu Chinhua, yeah, I, I, I agree. You know, what's interesting, of course, as I said earlier, a lot of observers have noted uh, we've never had a, a premier who wasn't a vice premier. But it's also pretty rare to go from this, the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, where Wang Yang currently sits, to the premiership. Usually you go down, not up. <laughs> and so that uh, would be unusual if he were to get it. Uh, and in terms of mentioning Xi Jinping's name 400,000 times, Hu Chunhua did the same thing, actually, in, uh, at, prior to the last party Congress, where my understanding is he got wind that Sun Zhong Tai was going down before Sun Zhong Tai knew he was going down. And I think Hu Chunhua realized, uh, I'm in trouble. I could be in trouble, too. So I better get the praise machine going. <laughs> and he seemed to have uh, survived in a way somewhat similar to Wen Jiabao's um, uncomfortable moment on Tiananmen Square in 1989 and yet managed to survive. Yeah. So it worked last time. It might work again this time. <laughs> and so do I, do I sense uh, an emerging consensus um, that uh, we should be uh, inclining our bets towards Hu Chinhua? Um, I think he'll be promoted. I'm not, I'm not as confident he'll be the premier, but we'll see. Hmm. Here's a wild card for you because we're drawing to the end of our time. Uh, if, um, let's just assume that um, uh, Xi Jinping decides to selectively apply uh, Xi Shang Baxia. And let's just assume, given his pronounced personal relationship with Liu He, that he decides to retain Liu He and have him continue. And furthermore, because Liu He uh, is the economic czar and the Chinese economy is generally, uh, we would analytically conclude, in something of a mess, both in terms of policy stasis, policy confusion, um, left, right, pro-market, uh, pro-state, whatever, separate seminar subject in itself. <laughs> but the post, post the Congress, there is a huge responsibility to restore growth. Mm. Uh, Hu Chunhua, possible, spent a lot of time in the South. I mean, I first met him, I think, in uh, Guangdong. Uh, uh, he was, I think, from Memory Party Secretary there. Am I right? Yes. Um, um, and would probably send a positive signal through his appointment to markets within China. Uh, Wang and Yang, outside of China. <laughs> and outside of China. Question mark whether Wang Yang would have the same effect. Uh, mm. But f final bids on the question of um, the crazy uh, option, which is to, um, to ask uh, Liu He to stay on. Loyal to Xi Jinping personally and a serious economic technocrat at the same time and of global, global standing. Uh, one minute from you, uh, Dr. Lee, then one minute from Chris, and then I'll close our session. Okay, so the 
to retain Liu He for another term will mean the breaking of the age limit rule. Mm -hmm. uh, that will create some <clears throat> consequences that Xi Jinping wouldn't want to deal with. And the, again, the testing case was Wang Qishan. Wang Qishan contributed significantly uh, or decisively even for Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign in his first term. And uh, there, he, he was more obliged to keep Wang Qishan at the time than he would be now in keeping Liu He, I would think, because of the unique contribution of Wang Qishan for the centralization of power for Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping didn't go with it. He complied with the age limit rule. So if that's a sign of Xi Jinping's appreciation of institution and the age limit rule, I think he will continue to do the same and leave Liu He out. Good, okay, Chris, concluding word from you. Sure. Uh, well, I just uh, for the record, my, my understanding was Xi Jinping was actually happy to see Wang Qishan go, but that's that's another <laughs> that's another that's, um, that's, that's another so seminar. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, but uh, on on the issue of Liu Ha, I agree with Dr. Lee, uh, maybe for slightly different reasons, not so much the age restriction as I think if we are fair, uh, Liu Ha is, as you say, Kevin, a, 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 a sterling economic technocrat. He has real credentials. He's Western educated. He gets it right. And also he He's a market-oriented guy, uh, generally speaking, um, and is well-respected uh, by people both in China and abroad. If there's a knock on him, though, however, it is that he lacks the operational skills or credentials. In other words, he never ran a province. He never ran a ministry. He didn't have to do that kind of cracking heads work, right? He's an economic theoretician to a certain degree. And I think Xi Jinping, while generally happy with his performance, has criticized that aspect on occasion. So I think what he's looking for now in that role is somebody with more of that operational experience. I think this is why you get uh, references to... Um, the current National Development and Reform Commission chairman, uh, Li Feng, as a possible candidate uh, to succeed in that Liu He role and so on. He has those credentials as a guy who, uh, pardon my crassness, gets blank done, you know, within the system. <laughs> and I think that's uh, going to be uh, front and center because, as you say, restoring growth is going to be very, very important after the party congress. Well, fascinating conversation. Thank you to both of you, because this is a complex business. And as we've seen from our discussion, the complexity lies in this um, a moving feast of Chinese norms, Communist Party norms about uh, retirement age limits uh, and term limits. Um, but within that, what we seem to have concluded is that outside the position of general secretary, uh, that the practice which has emerged is to apply relatively rigorously um, the 68 retirement age. And therefore, that gives us a level of predictability in terms of the number of vacancies at the standing committee level and, of course, at the general, Politburo, general Politburo level. And then if I listen to the conversation carefully as well, um, it's that um, uh, this, uh, given the immediate challenges faced uh, in terms of the Chinese economy, a lot of our various candidates uh, available, uh, Hu Chunhua could well achieve what Liu He would achieve uh, without violating any age limit principle. Uh, Hu Chunhua also has significant provincial experience, uh, which uh, Liu He does not. Wang Yang, of course, would have uh, would similarly meet those requirements, though perhaps in terms of market confidence within China, uh, Hu Chunhua would be seen as stronger uh, than Wang Yang, in my judgment, though we haven't tested that more broadly. As for um, our friend from Shanghai and He Li Feng from the NDRC, uh, my judgment, and I'll conclude with the prerogative of the chair, is that they would have the reverse effect in terms of market sentiment. Uh, within <laughs> China. But that's a subject for another day. Um, thank you very much, Chris Johnson. Thank you very much to you, uh, Li Ling, uh, joining us all the way from Vienna. We appreciate that. And this is, um, as I said, one in a number of um, public events and um, policy papers uh, that we are producing uh, on decoding the 20th Party Congress between now and whenever it's he held, September even, more like <laughs> 
October, um, October, November. So we'll we'll leave the date to be determined um, because I haven't got my email from the Central Committee telling me when it's on yet. So. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chris, and thank you, uh, Leeling. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you, Kevin. All the best.